I'm not sure what you were all up to during the months of lockdown, but I'll tell you my experience. All of my classes for grad school, my meetings for my part-time job, my interactions with friends and family had all moved online to Zoom, probably like most of you as well. I took all of these Zoom calls by myself in my one-bedroom apartment. It wasn't that bad, really. I had lovely views of my neighborhood. I enjoyed cooking new foods for myself. I even did some landlord-friendly apartment renovations. And, okay, truth be told, I wasn't that lonely because I had the most amazing roommates. I want to introduce you to them. So this is Hazel, Daniel, Jack, Tom, Dodie, Shannon, Dom, and Sammy. Oh my gosh, we had such a blast. They're all around my same age. They're artists, musicians, writers, filmmakers, actors. And we would spend a lot of time together in my apartment playing board games, bullet journaling, cleaning, cooking, working. Only one thing made them unconventional roommates. They have never stepped foot in my apartment. And I highly doubt any of them have even been to Pittsburgh. That's because the vast majority of them live in the UK. <laughs> They're all artists and creatives, and many of them are YouTubers who vlogged parts of their lives from around 2014 to the present. I've never met a single one of them, and not a single one of them have ever met me. And yet they made for the perfect roommates. Today I'm talking with you about parasocial relationships. These are relationships that go in one direction. This is a way you feel attached to a person that's real or fictional. And before you and I build our parasocial relationship as someone talking and someone listening, I'll share who I am. I'm Sarah Shrek. I work in arts and marketing. And I've been what the kids these days call chronically online for about as long as I can remember. I first got really interested in parasocial relationships in undergrad where I studied the impacts of binge watching on the feelings of connectedness we have with characters in the media. But I became interested yet again earlier this year when something unfortunate fell a, befell a company called The Second Try, run by the Try Guys. The Try Guys were four super fun, wacky, family-friendly guys who would film videos where they try stuff. Well, earlier this year, um, one of the guys, especially the one who presented genuine yet heightened versions of himself as a guy who really loved his wife, got caught cheating in public by a fan. The internet exploded. Not only did their 8 million subscribers have a lot to say, it got covered on Twitter, it trended on Twitter for many days, SNL covered it in an interesting way, and the way that a lot of fans seemed to be reacting was in a way that reflected a strong personal investment. A lot of people felt as though the decisions made by someone that they had never met and likely would never meet affected them personally. And I have to say, I wasn't unique to that situation. I was, I was in the same boat. It got me thinking, why do we all care so much about the behaviors of people that we don't know? And does it have anything to do with the amount of time that we spent together with them during the COVID-19 pandemic? So I'll start with the basics. What is a parasocial relationship? So as I've covered, it's the one-way attachment we feel with someone that we don't necessarily know. For example, you probably have a favorite character in your favorite book or your favorite television show who you know a lot about because you have access to a lot of information about them, but they don't necessarily have any knowledge of you. I have some examples as well as some guiding questions that might make you think of some people that you might share a parasocial relationship with. Do I invest my money in this relationship? Do you buy concert tickets, merchandise, subscriptions, memberships? Do I set important time aside to spend with them? Do I know when their show comes on? Am I desperate to find out just who is going to be picked on The Bachelor or Bachelorette? Shout out to you, Mom. I know you look up the answers online in advance. <laughs> Do I treat their hardship or passing as I would a personal friend's? Sometimes the people that we find ourselves invested in, we react more strongly to their hardships than we do people we know. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. It's just an interesting thing that happens in parasocial relationships. So it's not just me in my room with my parasocial roommates. It's also all of you, and it's also everybody else. <laughs> Studies conducted near the end of lockdown proved that as our human interaction went down with everyone else, our reliance on our parasocial replacements for those relationships increased. No matter how you engage with people, if you're a socially anxious person or not, you relied more on people that you didn't necessarily know to get that human interaction. So we have these relationships, but why do they form? Influencers are most successful when they build strong connections with as many people as possible who are invested personally in their lives, families, relationships, or artistic output. 
This is one way that we have changed the way we relate to people. And I want to dial back just a little bit to uh, the progression that we've seen over the past few years, especially during the pandemic. So let's start back where I mentioned binge watching, which when I studied it was a pretty new phenomenon. When we moved from consuming media in a traditional way, where we were fed images of Walter Cronkite or Oprah Winfrey, to streaming, we were able to self-select the people who connected with us the fastest. And not only could we pick to spend time with them, we could choose to spend hours upon hours with Snooki or the Tiger King or the cast of House of Dragons. In the same way that binge watching changed the way we related to fictional characters, the way that social media operates today has changed the way we react to people in our real lives and beyond. So you can sort of think about the social media platforms that you use. You're notified about friends and family in the same exact place that you're notified about celebrities, public figures, candidates, uh, influencers. Our brains begin to fire similarly, especially as marketing professionals realize that brands better connect with people when they look like your friend. This isn't as malicious as it sounds, but it's taking advantage of the way we connect to people. So for example, let's take a look at my Instagram feed. I might be scrolling through and see, oh, here's a post from the Try Guys, and here's a post from, uh, from my friend Lexi from high school or from college. And my brain fires in a similar way. I'm seeing Keith in a very normal, like casual, maybe slightly posed situation. And I'm like, oh, Keith, I miss him. I haven't seen any from, anything from him in a while. I hope he's doing well. And then I see Lexi and I'm like, oh, Lexi, I miss her. I haven't seen her in a while. I hope she's doing well. <laughs> it's all very much the same and it looks very similar, except one's an influencer and one's someone that I know in personal life. You can also imagine this if you FaceTime a friend. You see their face, they're talking to you, and there are little boxes on the screen letting you do different things. Let's say Cardi B is having a live stream, and she's looking right at you, and she's saying things to you, and there are little boxes on the screen that let you do different things. The lines between fiction and reality of who you know and who you don't know get progressively blurred. OK, so we have these weird relationships now with Doug the Pug or the Cats of the Bachelor. And yes, I do think we have parasocial relationships with dogs, and you can't take that away from me. <laughs> I like to look at this with what was referenced before, Bowen Family Systems Theory. Now, I'm very enthusiastic about this theory, but I'll let you explore it in your own time. I can only bring up two of the concepts today, and it's really, really fun and exciting to look at it. But first, I have to define a word. It's a word that we don't love, or at least I don't love. Anxiety. Now, in this context, I'm using anxiety to describe not only the feeling that you get when you're having an anxiety or panic attack, or the feeling I had over there before I came up to public speak, it's also the feeling that tells you you have to do anything. The simplest form of anxiety is what little alarm goes off in your head when you realize, oh, I have to use the bathroom. Anxiety is just the sensation that tells you you need to do something. It doesn't tell you what you need to do, and it doesn't tell you why you feel it. It's just the thing that motivates us to move forward in some way. And this way is the individual emotional process. This is when we register anxiety for whatever reason, sometimes we don't even know why, and then we do something about it. These could be healthy behaviors like calling a friend or going on a walk, but it also can manifest as things that society deems as less healthy, like increased alcohol consumption or focus on one's body or relationships. The individual emotional process can take shape in a literal shape, <laughs> known as the triangle. The founder of um, Bowen Family Systems Theory, Dr. Marie Bowen, posited that the smallest unit of human interaction is a triangle. So here we've got a family with some really simple names, <laughs> parent A, parent B, and child C. Let's say, for example, parent B is registering some anxiety. We don't really know why, they might not really know why, maybe it's something in their environment or their job or their relationship, but they feel it. And their attention is pulled for one reason or another, to their child, thinking, I hope my child is happy enough or accomplishing enough. I'm gonna direct this anxiety that I feel and focus on my child. Whatever way the child responds in, parent B and child C grow closer. They become what's known as insiders, which is a slightly more comfortable position to be. And parent A is left on the outside, probably trying to get back inside, find some closeness with either parent B or child C. This doesn't just apply to families, however. We also have some friends at school in the drama club. We've got Jamie, Sam, and Billy. They're all trying to get the lead role in the spring musical, so that means their anxiety is pretty darn high. <laughs> well, who's the insider and who are the outsider? Who's, who is the outsider and who are the insiders? Well, the position is constantly changing. 
Sam talks to Billy about Jamie getting the lead role, and Jamie talks to Billy about Sam getting the lead role, and everyone's talking about everyone else getting the, you get the point. Insiders and outsiders are not a fixed position. It's just the way that we move around. So let's come back to my lovely little apartment during the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm watching my lovely fake roommate COVID friend, Hazel Hayes, talk about her book. Oh, I'm so happy and I'm so calm. I'm so soothed by watching her talk about the writing process. It doesn't really look like a triangle yet. And you might not see where anxiety is flowing. Let me add a few more elements. My friends. My wonderful, wonderful friends who I've terribly ignored during the COVID-19 pandemic because of all the anxiety that existed around interacting with them in person. Typically, the triangle would have looked like this. I would have been paying attention to Hazel, but I also would have had two-way communication with my friends in person where I prefer to engage with them. However, the pandemic did something to our communication where it got cut off. That had a lot to do with my communication styles, but the larger environment had a role to play. Well, anxiety started registering me in a new way because it could no longer travel between my social relationships in the same way it used to. Well, where did it go? Right to Hazel. <laughs> Hazel was the person that helped me stay calm and helped soothe my feelings of anxiety that I was registering for many reasons that had nothing to do with her or her book. And my friends began to fade just a little bit into the background. When you register anxiety, it tells you to do healthy or unhealthy things or a vast spectrum of things that don't even need labels of healthy or unhealthy. What happens if you just sit with the anxiety and you listen to it? Well, when we do that, we notice stuff. We notice what gets under our skin. We begin to learn a little bit more about ourselves and what we're reactive about. It's really, really challenging, more challenging than it seems. But if we do that, if we notice some stuff, we get the best gift of all, in my opinion, information. It's so valuable to know how we operate and engage in a way that can either be emotionally neutral or very reactive, where we get to learn more about ourselves. But OK, I do have some of those questions, and I'll get to those. So we can sort of think a little bit more about changes in our parasocial relationships. I'll start with this, retracing your steps. We've kind of already covered this, but it's where you arrive in front of the TV watching The Office and you're like, huh, how did I get here? What led me to turn this on? What led me to open up my phone and scroll through TikTok? How did, how did I arrive? You set down the phone or you shut off the TV and you think for a moment about what anxious feeling may have occurred the moment before you turned on the TV. Try to track how you got there. Next is respecting boundaries. This can be tough. As people post different stories, you may wonder, are they dating? I thought I saw him in that post, and I thought I saw them in that other post, and I really want to know, and who should I ask? How can I find out? It's not the information that was offered to you. And this is a great opportunity, especially for me, to sit down and think, why do I care so much about their relationship? What does it matter to me? Is there a relationship in my life that I want to know more information about that I'm using them to sort of get that same feeling? Or are relationships a hot topic issue that I need to spend more time thinking about for myself? Third, it's important to recognize neglect. If you have as many unread text messages as I have, first of all, sorry friends. <laughs> but third, you can think about um, shifting your attention from commenting or liking photos on Instagram of influencers or celebrities and just engage with your friends for a week and see what that does. Watch home videos instead of YouTube, or listen to, instead of listening to a podcast, call a friend. Parasocial relationships do do good things for us sometimes. <laughs> when you're alone in your apartment for 16 days, as I was during the pandemic, I needed my fake roommates in order to feel like a human being. In her TED Talk, uh, Dr. Jennifer Barnes, who I really encourage you to check out, um, she talks about something called the social facilitation effect. And this is where if you look at an image of someone with whom you share a parasocial relationship and a friend that you know personally, you get the same level of positive cognitive benefit. You feel supported. So just like Tom Hanks in Castaway with his Volleyball Wilson, when we don't have access to community, we need our parasocial relationships to continue on healthily. Also, that's not the only positive thing it does. There was a study done at the University of Buffalo where young men were exposed to pictures of their favorite superheroes on a scale of musculature, from weak to muscular. And when they looked at the superheroes like Batman or Spider-Man with whom they had formed a parasocial relationship, the more muscular those superheroes got, the more positive that young man's self-image got. Because they saw themselves in their parasocial relationships, they identified it so strongly that when something positive happened to them, they felt as though that reflected in themselves. Their grip strength also got better, which I find very fascinating. <laughs> 
we can identify traits in the people that we like spending digital time with and see if that's something we want to manifest in our real lives. I love watching YouTube videos of people making cabins by hand, but I certainly don't know anyone who does that. Shout out to anyone who does that. I would like to be your friend. <laughs> we also have a phenomenon called societal mirroring and learning. Katie Couric, the reporter or journalist that you all might know, she uh, uh, televised her colonoscopy a couple years ago. Well, that is a very brave thing to do, obviously. But when she did that, the number of colonoscopies that people were getting increased. We tend to do what we see other people do. And when that's a healthy activity, that's a wonderful thing. We can also learn from people, not only from the procedures they get, but from the mistakes they make or the professions that they're in. Finally, I want to talk about community. <laughs> so community occurs in a triangle between yourself, someone you're parasocially focused on, and everyone else who shares that parasocial focus with you. You're likely already in a community of concert goers, book readers, show watchers, maybe you're in a forum online or a book club. And this is a great way to expand the focus you have on one person to build relationships with a bunch more people. You can connect with those people through your parasocial relationship and then expand those friendships to include other topics and other things that, that add an enrichment to, to that relationship. So, I'll paint the final part of my picture. It's the beginning of this year, 2022. I had baked every cake recipe I'd seen by Daniel J. Layton, and I shared it with all my friends. I'd read Hazel and Shannon's books, and I recommended them to people on Goodreads. I'd listened to Jack and Dom's uh, respective podcast. I joined some Discord servers to talk with other people about the movies they were talking about. And Sammy and Tom had made a, uh, a board game that I played with a bunch of friends in my apartment. Every parasocial relationship can be expanded. So many people talk about parasocial relationships like they're bad or frivolous or unhealthy. But I think that they're the natural progression of human beings in a high anxiety, low interaction environment. It's what we learn from them, what we can do with them, and how we grow as ourselves through them that I think makes them so valuable. So my partner Jack and I got in my car and we drove to Brooklyn, met up with some friends, and we saw Dodie live in concert. It was so strange as I sat up in the balcony so far away, seeing a person that I had identified as kind of my COVID roommate for so long, so far away, finally in person. She, had, she knew me just as little, and I knew her just as comprehensively. Nothing had changed, except I had gotten to know myself that much better. Thank you so much. <laughs>